God help me, this ridiculous fucking movie was fucking amazing. <laughs> I, okay, well, I, not amazing. It was not amazing. It, 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 it's <laughs> fucking Inferno is the most weirdly admirable movie I've seen all year. It is the most. Uh, it, that is, it's the like the hardest working bad movie. Yeah. Like, it, how do I put this? It's like um, it's the Mel Gibson of movie making. In a in a strange sense, yeah, because because like Mel Gibson makes bad movies, but they're not bad because they're poorly made. You know, like you say what you will about Apocalypto and <laughs> <laughs> Apocalypto and Passion of the Christ. I don't know. I loved Apocalypto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but say what you will about those movies. The reason why they're bad is not because of the technical prowess at hand. It, the, they're bad because. Are either one exploitative, exploitative to the point of being hysterical, or the conceit of the movie is just so, so tenuous. It's stretched so thin and so broadly that there's almost nothing there. Yeah. And in and in a way, Inferno suffers a lot of suffers from the same the same problems as those movies. But it, it tries so hard. Yeah, like you forget that you know this is Ron Howard. This is Tom Hanks. This is. You know, these are professionals. They try their best at making, you know, at making the material work. And, um, you know, I'll, even though a lot of people didn't come to the defense of uh, Cloud Atlas, I would. I mean, I, I love Cloud Atlas, especially wait, because of... Who, 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 wait, do you have to come to the defense of Cloud Atlas? Yeah, because it was pr pretty split down the middle. Okay, well, that's true. Yeah, like, there is, you know, you either really, really loved it or you really, really hated it. I don't it. think, I've, I've never known anybody who hated it. It's always been people who loved it or people who didn't understand. Or <laughs> said it was too hard to figure, to under, to follow. And to me, if your reason you hate a movie is because it's too hard to follow, that's usually, I hate to say it, but that tends to say a little bit about yourself. Mm. Maybe not as much about the movie. Uh, but then there's convoluted. Yeah, then there's convoluted. Now, that's needless convolution. Is that's a different story. But if it was well put together, but you were too maybe too lazy to to follow the whole time, or maybe you were tired. I don't know. Whatever your reason. Mm -hmm. But but I feel like what made Cloud Atlas work the most was Tom Hanks' performance all throughout it, yeah. all throughout that movie. Even when he's tasked to put on like this ridiculous accent in the middle of the 19th century, or put on like weird makeup and being an English gangster and such, he still owns every role that he was tasked to play in here, and work with let's let's put, let's put our cards on the table. Really, really ridiculous material, and this is such the and such is the case of as Inferno, and he does not you know hold anything back, and neither does Ron Howard. Neither does anyone in this movie, and that's what makes this movie work, but not in a. <laughs> it's, it's amazing because I didn't. <laughs> it's amazing because it works. It, it's amazing because it works, but it's not a good movie. It's. You, that's that's the thing is, um, it, it's an entertaining movie. Oh yeah. Uh, the plot is. It's almost like a James Bond version of the Da Vinci Code. It's like, it's more, it's like it picks, I guess that the films kind of picked up action the more they, they went. Um, but, but the thing is, it's, uh, it's not nearly as crazy as we thought it would be. We imagined a movie that was, we saw a movie from the trailer that was going to really like take the, uh, take the, uh, story into a much more like science fiction-y, supernatural, mythological area. Like Ninth or, Gate. Or, yeah, taking it, t take really break that boundary. Another ridiculous movie, by the way. Um, I know you like you liked it, but in spite of its ridiculousness. I I love the Ninth Gate because I saw it as a kid, and I probably really enjoyed it then. Uh, I I have to rewatch it again at some point, and uh, I'm afraid to. <laughs> Yeah, you don't exactly have the best track record of having most the most pristine memories of movies you yeah. saw as a kid. <laughs> he recently saw the Nostalgia Critic video on Dreamcatcher. <laughs> you remembered a completely different movie, didn't you? <laughs> John C? <laughs> he was like fucking Inspector Gadget's evil twin. Holy shit, but... 
But moving... Uh, yeah, back to the subject at hand. And so this is just two hours of nonstop action, like, uh, and suspense and... Uh, pursuit. Uh, pursuit. And, and they, uh, the, the music's a little corny, but it, it, it does the job mm. for the scenes. And uh, it, it never, yeah, it never slows, never really slows down. There's never a dull moment. And it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, you know, it, it delivers in, on that front. But there's a lot of, you know, problems, of course. Like the entire idea of having this plastic bag uh, full of the uh, Inferno virus just kind of down in the, uh, like... In the, ca in the catacombs. Down of... in the catacombs of this cathedral uh, with... In, with in, in Turkey? No, Istanbul. In, in Istanbul, in Turkey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but and the idea is that they have to blow up all the walls like they have to put they have to put demolitions on each wall in order to blow up the cathedral in order to break this plastic bag. It you know like a knife wouldn't do it. No 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 that's, no 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 that's that's way too easy. <laughs> like this plastic bag must be made out of fucking like a black rock from space or. And they have like to that. have like an entire fail safe plan in case it doesn't work so that other people can can do this can break the bag. And it's full of codes, and it is ooh, <laughs> and all kind, all kinds of misdirection, and just needless, needless. Well, going back to the word convolution again, but needless convolution yeah. for this plan of where you basically all you had to do was twelve monkeys it, and have a guy with a briefcase walk into an airport and open the damn thing up. Like, hey, it's like this is. <laughs> This is, uh, you know, this is this is this is a dangerous uh, virus. This is used to contain, um, uh, what was it called that they put it in? Oh, that, like, that vial. Yeah, you know, like a biohazard vial. Uh, with a with a thumbprint uh, identification, but yeah, it's just like, hey, you want to see what's in here? Smell it. <laughs> Done. Yeah, that, but like, I think where the movie succeeds is that, all right, first and foremost, this is a Dan Brown movie. Dan Brown novels are, have not been known to be, well, one, well-written, or two, grounded in any kind of believable narrative. Yeah. So, like, like this historical professor at Cambridge who specializes completely in symbology. What was his name? Land Landrick? Robert Langdon. La Langdon. Langdon. Robert Langdon. I tried to read the first Da Vinci book. I got about halfway through it, and I just... I mean, I've seen the first two movies. It's been a little while, but... Yeah, I, I didn't bother with the movies. Like, I just kind of closed the book and was like, you know what? I don't need yeah. to read any more wish fulfillment, you know, <laughs> Gary Stu novels. Oh, that's another thing, though. You don't need to have read, you certainly don't need to have read the books. You also do not need to have seen the first two films to watch this. It has, like, nothing to do with them except for, I guess, the relationship tie back to What's Her Face. Yeah, which kind of suggests to you all the importance of this character. But regard, but. Re mm. Regardless, uh, th th these these books and by extension the movies have never been one to situate themselves in within the real world because you know like the conceit of having all of these complex archaic puzzles being linked to some grand master plan that's you know touches the hem of the Illuminati and yeah. it, of course it's fucking ridiculous but the my problem with the books and in the in the first two movies was that. If you're going to be that weird, be weird. Like, venture off into, like, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of, Yeah, like, have art. some of that, uh, yeah. Like, these artifacts of immense... Tease, tease some of that supernatural. Yeah, exactly. You know, like... I mean, the trailer sure as hell did. Oh, it yeah. It turns out, if you've, if you've seen the trailer and we're expecting that kind of movie, um, it turns out that he's actually just remembering shit because he had a concussion. Concussion. Which turned out just like it's like an M Night Shyamalan thing. It it wasn't really a vision. It was actually a concussion. Then you find out it wasn't really a concussion. It was actually just a uh, it, it was just a simulated concussion it, using like a, a drugs. certain yeah using drugs. So it's just like how many fucking layers do you really need for this plan to work? It's like just kidding. I was a sports master. Jesus Christ. Just kidding. I was a forest fire. But no, he was just remembering shit. That that's what all that was. All those apocalyptic uh, visions and shit. He was just remembering shit, and his mind was a little funky. <laughs> yeah, and but the but to the to the movie's credit, to the movie's credit, it's that it's it feels like it wants to like the actors and the director want this to be ridiculous. They wanted to they. 
earnestly sold everything that was on the page. Mm. And the thing that let down their performances and the movie was just its inability to just go beyond the pale. Yeah. It just breached that uh, lunatic fringe, as it were. But the end result is no less, still no less entertaining because, like I said, Tom Hanks is such a such a and such an actor that if he's selling it as hard as he can, you have no choice but to buy it. And and as I said, that um, uh, Opie, <laughs> I Ron Howard, I Ron Howard is a is a director who, when he's <clears throat> passionate about something, he is passionate, and you can feel the passion on the screen, like Apollo thirteen. Yes. Like, like, Apollo 13 was one of the most ambitious movies th shot during its day, considering, like, what they had to go through in order to get those anti-gravity yeah. scenes. Like, they had to go inside a parabolic airplane, and then they can only shoot for, like, 40 seconds at a time, mm. and then they, they had to wrap up and shoot. So, like, that, such a hellacious, hellacious shooting schedule for, not only for the actors, again, Tom Hanks. Yeah. I mean, again, Tom yes. Hanks had to believe in that role so much that he volunteer to film who knows how many takes in a in such an atm in such an atmosphere is truly mind-bending but uh yeah true uh, yeah. tom hanks one of the most yeah the one of the most just i don't he's a great actor he is he does he is talented but he also puts forth more effort than like most people mm -hmm. ever will like and like the the idea here is commitment like him, Dustin Hoffman, even though, like Dustin Hoffman lately, not really, but back, but back in his, back in his era, like back in like the seventies and eighties, Dustin Hoffman left everyone else in the dust when it came to committing to a role. Him, Tom Hanks, and the one who kind of puts it to the comical extreme, uh, there will be blood, Lincoln. Oh, Daniel Day Lewis. Yeah, Daniel Day Lewis. He. He's sort of like a parody to that. Like he goes so, even further than that. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, did the, you hear the pleasure that, lines? Yeah, like did you hear that he actually caught like a nasty, nasty influenza because he refused to live in modern modern amenities to get himself ready to play his role <laughs> as uh, a butcher, like build a butcher in uh, Gangs of New York. Wow. Yeah, like. <laughs> He, in my left foot, he literally put himself in a wheelchair and he would not get out of it. So he literally had somebody had to wheel him around. Jesus. It's like, well, I'm working with you, Daniel. Yeah, that guy is just like, he... <laughs> wouldn't it be crazy if? <laughs> Jesus. Kind of reminds me of that Mr. Show sketch where uh, David Cross has... In order for you oh, to prepare yeah. for your role, you, you had to have, as your role as a mentally retarded person, you <laughs> yeah, literally to... had part of your brain removed and replaced with bubble wrap. Yes. To be as real as possible. For reality's sake. But uh, again, going off the yeah. going off the trail, but uh, I think we need to kind of establish um, establish the tone of the movie by talking about its talking about its conceit. It's um, Ben Foster. Who I, you know, who was um, Cadgar. No, it wasn't Cadgar. It was uh, Mediv. He was Mediv in Warcraft. <clears throat> That's where you recognize that guy from. Oh my god, I recognize him, but I didn't see... Ah. Yeah, he was Mediv in Warcraft. Wow, that was him. Who, you know, like, who was arguably the best part of the movie. Damn, okay. He looked pretty different. I mean, his, yeah. Yeah, but... Uh, like the hair was completely different, so... Yeah, like, I, I can't really find a weak link in this cast at all. Ben Foster... Even though he plays the the villain of the movie, he doesn't really have. He's he's sort of like the the comedian in Watchmen. He dies at the beginning of the movie, and then everything everything regarding to the plot of the movie is just based on his actions in the past. Yeah. So, so even though he doesn't really have a lot of screen time, you he owns every moment on the. You're going to answer that. Nope. <laughs> nope. Uh, okay, but uh, yeah, he he owns every moment on the screen, and so like the movie opens with a bang where he's being pursued. Ooh, excuse me, he's being pursued by um, by agents for for reasons we don't know why. We already know that he's basically built a plague to try to wipe out cool humanity, even though the plan is fucking stupid, which I'll get into really quickly here. Uh, but uh, he he kills himself immediately, starts the plot. Now his plan. He created a virus that would wipe off, wipe out about mm -hmm. half the Earth's yeah, population. He said, uh, he said ninety. Uh, I think he said ninety-five percent of the population would get it. 
but it would wipe out roughly but, half the population. I mean, how can you really be sure about that? Yeah, well, yeah, because, you know, like I, I could wager that 5% of the population wouldn't be near any kind of major metropolitan area. Like, some rural areas of Africa would probably never get it, or people living in yeah. Antarctica, or any remote reaches in, like, Central America or South yeah. America. Yeah, there's a lot of people living in the... I mean, that part, but you could maybe figure out. But the, how many people exactly, like, or not exactly, but even roughly how many people it would kill? Yeah, like... I mean, like, have you tested this theory? Like, you can't he, test a theory like that. Yeah, like, he's just, he's completely ballparking it, but... He, under the, like, he's under the guise that we need to control the human population because, you know, we're growing rapidly and we're going to run out of the world's resources. We've heard the same song and dance before. But what I don't get is, like, he's likening this plague to the bubonic plague in the 12th century that wiped out about a third of Europe. But he said, like, well, because of that, uh, it gave birth to the Renaissance and blah, blah, blah. And one, that was incidental. <laughs> yeah. Like you to try to try to put direct causality between the bubonic plague and the Renaissance is I woo! can't woo. So. I mean like there's a lot of historical theories that suggest that like well because of the bubonic plague it wasn't like advanced in medicine which yeah. was an advanced in scientific thought which I would wager that considering <clears throat> that uh, a lot of what we consider to be the Renaissance was also uh, founded and predicated upon art and just free thinking that had more to, that was just the the that had more to do with the political landscape than it did the actual you know res direct response to the bubonic plague but that's just a tangent for another day it's really obviously it's a crazy it's a stupid idea it's it's, it's a stupid idea it's, it's an uncontrolled method that's the problem uh, when in a you know world mm -hmm. where everything has to be controlled uh, it doesn't work because there's a lot of like other implica there's a lot of other fallout that could happen from doing that even if you're able to get ha only half the population to like die from it mm -hmm. uh, you, there's still a lot of unseen circumstance circumstances surrounding that and yeah but but the and the worst thing though is that like towards the end of the movie where spoiler of spoilers uh, Robert Langdon's sidekick turns out to be evil and in cahoots with Ben Foster uh, it turns out that uh, you know she's in on it and tries to you know, tries to justify this act by saying that this will finally be our salvation. Saying, like, no, what you're doing is delaying the inevitable because we're still going to breed like rabbits because three billion people, yeah. you know, the, the population growth is still going to expand exponentially because that's just the rate of birth that humans, that humans are procreating at. So what you're doing is, like, okay, you're getting rid of all these people and then you're stymieing the rate of growth, but we're going to get that gro rate of growth back in about 100 years according to the math you yourself used like at the beginning of the movie it's just ben foster saying like in 1900 we had four billion people 1970 we had six yeah. billion people so you're saying that by wiping us back to the 1900 days you're giving us an extra 100 years before we're back to the same problem i didn't think i don't think you thought this through yeah <laughs> so <clears throat> like just the very conceit of the movie is stupid I mean, it doesn't take, uh, it, it takes little thought to say, like, okay, this guy's fucking crazy. And what's, uh, and they even go, uh, they even reveal that he had contacted, uh, uh, what's her face again? I can't remember. No, but, Langdon's uh, former squeeze. Yeah, Langdon's former squeeze that, uh, that, uh, he wanted them to put out, uh, sterilization, uh, components in people's water and whatever. And it's like, okay, so that's actually a much better way to try to control the population than putting a disease out that kills half of them. That's a much more humane way of doing it. So mm -hmm. why didn't they try to do something more like that? I mean, I understand that the, you would have to have, like, collaboration in order to do that, I guess, was the reason. Yeah, because you need access to people's drinking water. But, I mean, it's like if they were, uh, if they understood, if they were of, you know, if they were of stable mind enough to understand that that's a better way. A far better way, and probably if yeah, the, it's just why didn't they could have come up with something much better than this? Yeah, but you know what? I actually one of the the interesting twists of this movie that I actually really liked, and I wasn't expecting this movie to do it, was that uh, the uh, secret agency that Ben Foster hired to hide him for two years while he worked on the retrovirus tur finds out about the plan and joins the good guys. When was the last time you saw, like, a shadow Blackpool organization realizing, hey, um, this whole uh, virus that can wipe out half our half the Earth's population, that's kind of bad for business. 
I mean, I've seen so many stupid fucking plots revolving around viruses that businesses want to create and sell to the highest bidder, thinking yeah. that there's a market for killing 200, you know, like 200 million people or 2 billion people. In a way, it's refreshing. Yeah, it is. Because it's different. Yeah, like I mean, maybe, maybe it's even realistic. Yeah, it's actually like you clearly understand their motivations. Like, okay, this guy spent you know five hundred million dollars of his own money to hire this private security force to hide him out for two years. Then they find out that they're hiding out, hiding this guy out to create a virus that's going to wipe out potentially all of their clientele. Yeah. So it's like, okay, why do we why don't we join the good guys in the World Health Organization and find this fucking virus? Oh and my god! Get, and get paid. To do it. Yeah, it's like, oh my god. Clear character motivation that makes sense. And he literally, you know, he asks them to hire him to help. <laughs> so... Which, you know, like, if there was, a, if there was a, like, a legitimate weak point in this movie, besides its stupid premise, it's that uh, the unneeded angle of the, uh, the bad guys that want to abduct the virus and sell it on the black market... Because that's just, you know, like, again, that's just more of that stupidity rearing its ugly head. And it doesn't really do the film any favors because it's not so ridiculous as to merit the effort uh, on display. It's just more and more, like, same tired bullshit. Even though the guy, uh, I forgot the actor's name, who was the agent for the black market, he was, uh, he, he was a fine, he, he did well with the material. Like I said, there's not a weak link in this cast. No. So, like, even even the weakest part of the movie, like, the the extraneous, you know, extraneous plot thread that goes absolutely nowhere other than to create, like, a sub-boss for Robert Langdon to not fight. <laughs> even that doesn't seem... Even even that was done as, as admirably and, and as professionally as one can yeah. really expect anyone to do. So, so, from that angle, you know what this... You know what this movie is? What is it? It is, it's a world-class chef mm -hmm. trying to make a five-star meal using nothing but, like, grocery outlet 99-cent bargain <laughs> bin items. And uh, and for some reason, because this is like a food network... Not to say that it was made on a budget? N no, but it was like, but... It, but it was, but it is to say that it's in the hands of such profession such professionals that they can make something that looks and tastes wonderful. But then there is a part of you that knows, like you're eating fucking sun kissed tuna, sun kiss, like you're eating star kissed tuna on what looks like a half eaten trisket. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's that's it's kind of like you know here's it's almost like a challenge. Here's this concept. Here's this plot. Go. <laughs> It's like, you know, can you do it? Can can you can you do it? Can you make a movie out of this and uh, a good movie out of this? One could make the argument that that the today's blockbusters are nothing but that. That Marvel movies are just these ridiculous premises made flesh, like mm -hmm. Doctor Strange, a doctor yeah. who gets you know, like who gets Zen powers and is able. But call it a superhero film. But call it a superhero film, and all of a sudden your expectations are just kind of halted. Like you're you lend the movie a sense of artistic credibility, and why can't we do the same thing for this movie? Yeah, yeah, here? you know, actually, uh, uh, he could have uh, Langdon or what was that Langdon? Uh, Robert Langdon. Robert Langdon could have been a superhero. In his own way, yeah. Like, you know, his power is that he has to be uh, basically conned into uh, helping people, and he's really good at it. Like, there's plenty of comic book characters where the, where historians give necessary information and basically act as curator for uh, relics of alien origin or historical origin. So, in that sense, Robert Langdon's movie, like, this movie doesn't feel out of place in, like, say, a Marvel universe. Yeah. I mean, like, if we can believe Ant-Man, if we could believe fucking Thor and fucking, I'm sure we'll all go see Doctor Strange, even though I will not be uh, in town to see Doctor Strange, unfortunately. So we're going to miss out Sage Versus on that, sadly. But regardless, I, uh, I feel that people are going to look at this movie and just look at the premise and look at the hokey nature of it and just not going to, they're just not going to see past it. They're just not. And I think that's kind of unfair to the movie. I, I think that's unfair to the effort yeah. that people put in this movie. And weirdly, and I'm really thinking about, like, Tom Hanks just trying so damn hard, <laughs> so damn hard to, to realistically convey this 
sporadic, almost fragmented notion of following this thin line of logic as to where they need to go next. Like, you could see how he really put in a lot of effort to this movie and uh, perhaps not so much for... Uh, for um... What was the uh, the the driver the airplane the airplane airplane pilot uh, no, it was Snowden? So I keep thinking about the last movie that we saw. But and then there was also the one before that with him. Uh... Oh, with Sully. Sully. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because unfortunately, like he did try with Sully. I but he the material didn't call for him to try yeah. in a weird way. I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess that was probably the character it was just kind of this normal, boring guy like, who yeah. did the, you know, the right thing. And yeah, like in, in real life, that's great. Normal, normal guy yeah. does his job in a fantastical situation, and everyone survives. It's a great story, but in real life, in a movie, it's just sort it's of just trying to have an accurate depiction, yeah. non very, very little, you know, dramatization of it. Yeah. So, like, where Sully was, like, Tom Hanks trying to be sincere, sincerely reserved, which is in and, in and of itself admirable, but doesn't exactly make for an entertaining <clears throat> sit. This is the complete opposite direction, where, like, everything is just, like, these gigantic leaps in logic. You know, I think that they just had fun. In a weird way. Making the movie. I think they just had fun, and it really... Like, uh... like, they, they, like the whole cast and crew yeah. was out in beautiful landscapes of, that were in beautiful cities in Italy. Yeah, you and, know, and it's, it's kind of, uh, you know... It's... Like, it shot well, and yeah, like the architecture it's... was beautiful, and it was all kept, and it was all kept in a, in, and framed in, in a way that you felt like you were there. It was, yeah. like, a, there's no one part of the actual movie-making process of this movie that it really is at fault here. And though it was a wacky concept, you know, it was still a fun thing to, to do. It yeah. was still a fun thing to uh, to be a part of, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, going, you know, do, unearthing clues and stuff like that, like a treasure hunt, going to the next thing, going from one place to the next. It's You can get into that. Y yes, That's... especially at the clip that we're going at. It's a two-hour yeah. movie, but it keeps moving and moving and moving, and it never really lets up. Yeah. And, it, it, and it's not like Michael Bay syndrome where you're just constantly pelted with action scene after action scene that you're just... It's not a blur. Yeah, like you don't shut it off. Oh, and there's no CGI. It's like or if real there, sets and stuff. Or if it is, it was really it, well done. It, it was good, inter, it, well integrated. It was well integrated. Like like the, the visions that he saw. Yeah. The, that was, a lot of that was CG. But that was, but that was to the movie's credit, not discredit. Because every, like those visions were fun as fuck. They were so fun. <laughs> They were. Oh god, like this guy's leg sticking out of some another, you know, the, like, uh, like it's a it's a modeled after Botticelli's vision of hell, which is uh which is nice, but I would love like if they decided to go a different route with that. I've I've always been partial to uh Hieronymus Bosch's artwork of uh mm -hmm. you know, Midnight in the Garden of Paradise. Mm -hmm. You remember that painting? Yeah. Oh, how fun would that be to see hell like that? Oh, yeah. You'd to see like, you know, like guys with gigantic asses farting out lava and <laughs> And that that is an incredible that is an incredible fucking painting. I wish they would have used that, yeah. Because that's that's the painting that you can like look at every single time. Oh, have it in your house if you could, <laughs> or a replica uh, or print. And every time you look at it, you could see something different. Exactly. Like it, it, like I never saw that before, and I see it every single day. Yeah. No. Like if you if you don't know what we're talking about, uh, Google Hieronymus Bosch Midnight in the Garden of Paradise. Yeah, it's one of my like favorite paintings. It's amazing. Yeah, like it just, uh, just it's like almost like a Where's Waldo of just finding little instances of cruelty and, <laughs> and malice and ma depravity. Ma and... Malice and depravity, but like it's so cartoonish. Like there is a, I believe there is a little instance where somebody is literally shitting diarrhea into a funnel that somebody's had forced to drink. I <laughs> know <laughs> human centipede. Fuck yeah. yeah like, this was human this centipede came back way. Before yeah, back that. in the twelfth century yeah. or twelfth or thirteenth century. My uh, my art history is failing me at the moment, but it, it, it's such a, it, you know, that's that's us talking if we had our druthers. I'm. I'm sure, but but uh, but using the material, at, using the wonderful uh, r Italian Renaissance architecture and art as a, as a visual motif throughout the movie was a very very uh, visually arresting choice. Yes, and it and along with the the performances and along with the and along with the, uh, the the technical acumen behind the camera really creates a finely crafted piece of. What amounts to a McDonald's hamburger. <laughs> I mean, it's 
you know that this, this isn't intellectually nourishing. <laughs> You're you... reminding me of uh, uh, frickin' The Kingsman where he's serving up a McDonald's hamburger on a platter with, like, wine. This <laughs> <laughs> made a very happy meal. <laughs> Well, like, Kingsman isn't... Kingsman's like a Five Guys burger. It, it, it's supposed to be, like, you know, like, it's not good for you. But it's, like, just slathered with so much fat and grease. And well, just... I mean the actual scene. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. No, I mean, but, like, if we're, if we're trying to, like, create, like, an analogy here, this is... Um... This is what I like to... I stand by my statement I made earlier in this review that it is the most weirdly admirable movie I've seen this year because I've never seen so much... I've never seen so, so many people try so hard in one movie doing it as well as they did and come out the other side making an entertaining movie. A stupid movie. A ridiculous movie. And if you don't like the movie and you can't get past its premise, then I completely understand. But... I've seen so many people struggle with ridiculous premises and ridiculous material, and they just wind up making a boring, bad movie out of it. Yeah. Like, but I, I was expecting this movie to be, uh, you know, just a, a funny bad. I was expecting it to be just completely. You know, for our purposes, like silly bad, silly, insane bad, over the top camp or whatever, unintentional. But uh, I. It just turned out to be an entertaining kind of pretty good movie, pretty yeah. de decent movie. Pretty and uh, considering like like we keep coming back to it, but considering the sort, considering the material, what what they wound up with is truly and co truly admirable. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to add? <clears throat> yeah, there was a guy who had uh, <laughs> who had uh, Lang Robert Langdon's watch. <laughs> oh yeah. And that was there was a guy whose job in this movie was to have his watch ready for him at the end of the movie at the end of the movie and um through i just have to i have to explain this throughout the entire scene where they have their entire force their entire task force set to uh, uh recovering this 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 uh basically this this grocery bag <laughs> full of a, of a poo virus or whatever um and and there's ex and, and explosions do go off like at least one of the uh, one of the explosives does go off, and uh, uh, throughout all the mayhem, they finally you know uh, they finally recover the bag in their uh, containment box and everything, and seal it, and you know they're they're reminiscing, and she says, "I have something for you," to to Langdon, and she walks over to this guy who is just on hand, and talks to him for a second. He leaves for about like three seconds and comes back and hands him a, hands her a watch and she gives it to him and it's i realized that throughout this whole thing that guy's job basically was to safeguard his watch <laughs> but yeah like at the beginning of the movie langdon got abducted and lost his watch that his parents gave him a long time ago like they they actually had throughout all this planning to save the tried to save the world before the bombs went off she had the time to get this guy to make sure they had his watch ready for him at that point <laughs> i I know it was just a piece of sentiment at the end of the film, but that's you have, when you look at it, it's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, oh, speaking of funny, there is a legit. There is a part in the movie where they kind of failed in that they couldn't they couldn't sell the sincerity of the of the scene, and everyone in the movie just started everyone in the theater just started laughing, and that's when <laughs> when Robert Langdon goes to this Italian museum to pick up to pick up uh, Dante's death mask for a convoluted puzzle piece. And they're realizing, well, somebody stole the, the mask. And yet, they stole the mask, like, for nine hours. Nobody's, like, nobody noticed. Like, this priceless piece of art <laughs> <That> was, <laughs> like, nobody fucking noticed. That was I, more of the stuff I was expecting from the film. Yes. So, so they go through the security tapes, and it's revealed that Langdon stole the mask. He, but he was under mind-controlling drugs, of course. And uh, the, the best part is that... They're all looking at him like, uh, 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 and they cut to the footage, and he's just kind of like hamburglaring his way inside the, into the uh, into the display case, and everyone started laughing because, like, this is such a surreal scene where like, he... like the guy who stole it is standing right there with them, <laughs> like watching the his the his own footage of himself stealing it, and to anybody who's there other well even to him because he didn't expect it. <laughs> And to, so, so, but especially for the, for like everybody who's there with him, it's like, you would have to think if you were there, why the fuck is he right here? <laughs> I just picture Tom Hanks do, doing one of these, 
Well, time, time to be the, the dusty, old road. dusty trail. <laughs> it just, you know, <laughs> you know, putting on what was it? Uh, oh, oh, accent. And that, and right. and the, oh God! And the uh, uh, the the caretaker of the place or whatever. Um, she was. She really was great. Yeah, she like, she's she's just like you see you see Tom Hanks stepping you know, uh, it's kind of like okay we're gonna see like what happens after oh here's the call I got where I had to leave <laughs> yeah. you know conveniently leave you guys here <laughs> not suspecting a thing <laughs> and then you see, they kind of look at each other and then you know he starts to step over the the rope to get to the <laughs> box and she's looking at him she's like mm -hmm. it's like hmm hmm <laughs> hmm. <laughs> it starts to open. It's like, um, nah, like no. Nah. He's right here. It's like she was great. Yeah, it's just <laughs> the best part about that scene is that the entire museum is getting uh, surrounded by SWAT, and uh, for for some reason, everyone in the security room leaves the guy who clearly stole the mask inside the protected room. Like, hey, a distraction. <laughs> Let's leave the guy here and go check out the distraction. <laughs> <laughs> this kid couldn't possibly do it a third, a second time. <laughs> uh, and, and, and guess what? He does it a third, third time. time. <laughs> he does it again. At the end of the movie, Langdon goes back to the uh, goes back to the museum after he saved the day, and he tells one of the guys, like clearly the art museum, clearly the museum has not has not put up wanted posters of Langdon all over fucking Italy. You know, maybe this was just kind of like his like his severance package. I mean, maybe this is what he got. Like, he gets to rob me museum whenever he wants because he helped save the world. So, and they'll just pretend that they don't notice. The best part, though, is like he, he, he's back in the museum and he's telling a guy saying, hey, uh, why don't you turn on the lights to the, uh, to the Dante mask? I can't see it. It's like, well, the Dante mask was stolen. No, oh, it is. It's right there. And then he goes in. He's like, oh, my God, Luigi! Luigi! Like, he's calling everyone. Everyone's panicking. It's like, <clears throat> stop him. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> do, do, do. Did it for a third fucking time. The, Italy has the worst security guards <laughs> in history. <laughs> Italians! <laughs> that I think was even a point in the movie where he says, oh, only in Italy or something. It's like, it's like... <laughs> Outside of that one protracted yet hysterically bad scene that was great comedy though but that was that, intentional or otherwise it was really good comedy it oh god it, it, it cracked a smile on me that 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 was a broad just fully embraced you know smile from that scene and i real and i think what they all realized was that there was no way we could sell mm. this scene this scene as like the truly like they're, they're trying to play it as like drama like yeah. what in the world is going on this is intrigue but like, from the trailer that's how it looked it's like that's not me <laughs> instead they just kind of like they play it sincerely with all the intrigue but it, they realize like they realize that the reason why leslie nielsen is so funny in airplane <laughs> is because he stood all his ridiculous lines straight face straight face and sincere and that's what they did here. They realized, people are going to find this funny anyway. Let's not give them a helping hand. Let's not be wink, wink, nudge, nudge, saying no more. Let's, yeah. let's just act the material like we're, you know, selling Shakespeare. And that's, that is the right attitude towards movie making. Right attitude. Uh, yeah, after that, I, I think I'm done. I'm tapping out. I'm good. Yeah. So if you, uh, if you uh, were at all curious about how a, such a movie can end up, I'd say go see it. Uh, be prepared for uh, be prepared to be shocked at the quality of the movie making, I suppose. Yeah. But otherwise, um, if you if like if you're if you're one of these Dan Brown haters that just hate everything he does because he he, he writes like shit and his movies are and his plots are preposterous, you're not. This movie's not going to change your mind. But um, other than that, uh, next week, as I said, I I will be out of town, but. Hopefully we'll be back in time. Uh, not quite sure what's going to be on online for us, but uh, can't wait to find well, out. Well, we're not going to see trolls. Thank. You. I, we're going to rent that movie. Uh -huh. We're going to and we're going to watch it. Uh uh. We're going to watch no. this. No. We're going to watch no trolls. No. Trolls. No trolls. <laughs> it's not happening. We have to see a movie that has the capacity to be worse than Medea. Why? 
So that way we don't have to be predictable with our year-end list. Like, anybody's going to think Trolls is not a contender. <laughs> but is it? We know how bad Medea is, but do we know how really bad Trolls, are, Trolls is? We can tell it's going to be bad, but do we know how bad? If we were to see it in theaters, I'd probably just walk out after three minutes. <laughs> and then waste some money. Is that what you want? <laughs> it, considering it's my money you're going to be wasting, fuck no. You're going to sit there and watch the entire movie. If I, Hey, I'll be suffering it with you, buddy. You don't suffer when we watch movies like that because you're enjoying me suffering. <laughs> I've seen what happened. <laughs> Damn it, I lost my poker face while watching Suicide Squad with you. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're, you're too obvious during those movies. You could at least try to act empathetic. <sighs> I, I hold out my hand for you. <laughs> Give me a Bailey armbar. <laughs> no. <laughs> Is that how Bailey does an armbar? She literally... She does like the arm thing where she's like, ah! And then she gives a high five. <laughs> so I love Bailey. She's awesome. She does like a Russian dance on people while she's doing... <laughs> oh, God. Can you tell we're excited for Helen to sell? Oh, uh, just... Yeah, it had to be Sasha, though. Well, hey, at least it's Charlotte. I'm very happy to see Charlotte and Helen sell. Yeah, right. Till next time.